All right, so thanks, Ben, for inviting me and all the other organizers. I think it's great to be um, in an audience of experts like this, so with a lot of feedback. Uh, so my, my talk is about um, copy number changes, and often, you know, because of the complexities of handling CNVs, people talk more about uh, deletions and so on, but I really want to focus on am uh, amplifications. And I think if you look at cancer, it's been known for a long time, and that's why I'm showing somewhat older data, this is array hybridization data, uh, which show all of these patterns of, of large regions of the genome being amplified. And I think a good question to ask is, what is it, what's the mechanism behind these kinds of amplifications? You know, oftentimes you think about tandem duplications and other basic models of rearrangement which can amplify, but those are usually not sufficient to address these kinds of dramatic changes over uh, somewhat tight breakpoints, right? So, so over the uh, last few years, uh, people have been developing different models, and I'll sort of pick uh, three of them and talk about each of them in some levels of, of detail. So the, uh, the first is the somewhat exotic model of breakage fusion bridge, which when they first started sequencing uh, paired ends, reads, and so on. So back in 2007, Bignell et al. had this very nice paper where they said that, look, this amplification actually bears all of the uh, hallmarks of the breakage fusion bridge model, which was first proposed by Barbara McClintock back in 1941. So something very ancient now playing a role in cancer. And it's good to see if we can find similar patterns in, in cancer. All right, so the other model that I'll, I'll talk about is this model. And of course, this has led to many other similar models, but I'll just talk about uh, chromotrypsis which really is, uh, when you think about it, quite an extraordinary event, uh, first proposed by Stevens in 2011, where they said that in this model, the genome just shatters into many pieces, and then the pieces come together. And that's why you get these interesting al alternating copy number pattern changes as well as very complex rearrangements. And then the question is, can we detect more of these in, in the tumor genomes? And then we'll go back to something that's really ancient compared to these models, so-called so episome model of amplification, which actually has been studied a lot by cytogenetic people. And then there was some early work done by Raphael and Pevsner many years ago, but it hasn't really caught the interest of, of the people in the sequence analysis committee, community. And I think we should really think about that too. And the model has many parts, and I'll go over these because I'm not going to talk a lot about this model in this talk. But, but I will come back to it towards the very end. So in this model, fragments break off at random to form extrachromosomal elements. And, and through recombination events, and as well as sometimes they carry these origins of replication, uh, they can re replicate, and so they can make more copies. And again, this is random. But the key thing here is that they don't have the centromere. And because they don't have centromere, when the cells divide, there's sort of random segregation and one cell might have more or less copies. And if a cell carries some kind of an oncogene or something that has proliferative properties, maybe that cell has selective advantage if it has more copies and the number of copies prolif proliferate. And that sort certainly is uh, as a way of explaining uh, high counts of amplification in the tumor genome. So the kinds of questions that you might ask is, well, if you have your tumor genome sample, which of these mechanisms uh, is going to be at risk. Okay, so again, we have some input data, mostly in the form of sequence data, because that's the most common one. And you would like to assign some kind of mechanism to the amplifications that you're seeing. And we are a long way towards answering this question systematically, but I will take some examples uh, to show how it can work in, in specific instances. And I'll start with breakage fusion bridge, because in some ways, uh, it's, it's somewhat the most cleanest, uh, the description is the most clean. Right, so, so just you know, an obligatory picture of Barbara McClintock back in 1939, where she uh, first talked about this phenomenon. It really arises when you have a break at the telomere, and that causes instability of the genome. So uh, uh, during anaphase, when the sister chromatids are formed, there's a bridge that's formed to stabilize the, the broken ends, and that causes a problem when the cells are separating, right? So just sort of this animation will explain the picture. So here we have um, two chromosomes, uh, which are stuck together by this bridge, and now we have dicentric chromosomes. 
And when there's cell division, there'll be stress on these chromosomes, so they have to break again, right? And just to show you some original data, this is from a, a, a breast carcinoma sample, and you can see there's a probe showing where the centromeres are, and you see all of these uh, chromosomes with two probes lighting up showing dicentric chromosomes. So it's sort of breakage fusion bridge in action, right? And uh, when, when these chromosomes, when I mean, the centromeres move apart, they will break, but they don't have to break necessarily at the bridge. And so what that results in is that if you segment this chromosome, then you get a prefix portion duplicated and inverted. And this process, now that the, you know, this end is broken again, this process can go on for a few cycles until either a bridge is formed or apoptosis happens, right? So, so just in a few cycles, you end up getting a highly rearranged genome. And again, and then you can see now this genome has many, many copies. Uh, and, and an interesting question that I sometimes give uh, as homework is if you're given a string like this over letters with duplications, uh, can you say if it can be created just using breakage fusion bridge? Uh, cycles, and that's, that's an easy question to solve, right? But let's talk about what we would get if we had sequenced data. So imagine that you have, you're sampling from a chromosome like this, but these, these segments are very long, like many tens of kilobases, so even the long read technologies today cannot bridge them, and it's very unlikely that you could assemble and get the final structure. So what you could do is do some kind of short read sequencing or other kind of sampling, and then just get copy number counts, and so in this case, a comes with copy number four, B comes with copy number four, and so on. So the question, sort of very clean combinatorial question, uh, is simply this, that if you're given uh, copy number data, such as this or this, um, is it consistent with a breakage fusion? So can you start with A, B, C, D, E, the, the natural segmentation, and through a sequence of breakage fusion bridge cycles, can you get it, all right? So this is the clean version, and then of course you have to add noise and, and be able to resolve this. And just to say that this is an interesting combinatorial problem, you can see that these two counts are very similar. And here I've reduced the count of A by one, and this one does admit a BFP, while as this one doesn't. And actually you can show that all the even numbers must follow before odd numbers. Maybe some of you can figure that out uh, while I talk. Right. So I'm not actually, the, we have a, uh, a linear time algorithm for this, but it's, it's way too complex to be explained. I'm going to start with somewhat an, an earlier description uh, approach that we had to the problem because it's just it gives some more insight into the structure and then I'll give you some hints about how the actual algorithm proceeds all right so here the slide is not empty I have put the string right out here and let's just do a few cycles on it but this time what we're going to do is as the amplification happens we'll put the A's always on the A's the B's always on the B's and C's always on the C's and that that will allow for the structure to reveal itself, all right? So the first uh, case, we had this AB prefix inverted and duplicated, and you get a structure like this. Then you have another one, another one. And then at the very end, you can take the entire string and duplicate it. And often, if the data is given to you like this, you could still do that extra simply by doubling everything, and that should be fine. And so you can see now that all the A's are lined up, the B's are lined up and you can see a little bit more structure on the breakage fusion bridge cycle. And really, just to reiterate, you know, the, the problem is given to you as a bunch of numbers, in this case 12, 10, and 2, and the goal is to be able to construct uh, a, uh, a path like this which satisfies the breakage fusion bridge criteria. All right, so uh, if you think about uh, just sort of joining out here, you can see a natural hierarchical structure, and we will exploit that. So I join all the adjacent A's, the adjacent B's, in the adjacencies and just make a tree. So the root node is the one corresponding to the C out here. And then you have five Bs out here, just half of the number of Bs because we are pairing up. And, and then uh, six or so As, I, I can count one, two, three, yeah, six As. Right, so there's a tree, and this tree has very nice properties uh, which we can exploit. First, it is symmetric. So uh, if you take any portion of the tree and you rotate it, you'll get an identical structure. And there's also something that we call paired symmetry. So if you take any two uh, consecutive occurrences of the node and do sort of an in order and take the subtree that's inside that, that's also symmetric. And then finally, the ends must be longer 
than the insights uh, at all subtrees. So if you have all of these three properties, it actually is a breakage fusion bridge. And then there's a one-to-one -one connection because anytime you have a tree like this, you can do an in-order traversal and that will give you a breakage fusion bridge. So our problem can be remodeled as saying, you're given these counts and can you make trees which have this property, right? And there isn't a polynomial. This formulation actually doesn't work to get an efficient algorithm, but it takes you part of the way. And we just sort of, it's an enumerative algorithm. So you start at the top level and there's only one node. And at the second level, uh, there are these five nodes, so there's only one way to connect them. And we just connect them here. But now we use the symmetry property. So whatever is the subtree out here is going to be the same as the subtree out here. And whatever is the subtree out here is going to be the same here. So we can represent that by multiplicities. And then we just solve sort of equations that can construct possible pairings uh, out here, uh, possible assignments of children through these, the solutions of these Diophantine equations. And you know, if you keep going like this, you will get possible structures, and you have to sort of enumerate. But the reason it works is that every time we are du doubling the multiplicity, and very soon, you know, sort of in a small number of steps, the multiplicities will be so high that there are very few possibilities left. So it terminates. In practice, it does terminate quickly for many examples. All right. So just some example. It's something that took, you know, 20,000 seconds now takes 12 seconds. And while both are tractable numbers, if you want to do large-scale simulations, the second one is a big advantage. You can't do really simulations with this. And so we, we tried this. We tried many, many different things, and it works fine. The only problem is that if you have errors, you know, if you allow sort of uh, edit distances from true count vectors and find the nearest BFB, then these methods just don't work. In fact, they can't really distinguish, except in some cases they can say, like in this case, that the nearest count BFB vector is so far away that this is not an exp expression of a BFB. So it's a non-trivial problem. You're given counts like this, and the, the algorithm can say that it's BFB or not. So we had to work harder to actually get the positive result. And I'm just going to go in a couple of slides to give you a sense of how that thing worked. So here we have the same palindrome, but it has sort of been laid on its side. And this time we go layer by layer and sort of just going through a couple of layers. So here we have these blocks, and you want to wrap the Bs. So all the Bs are on this layer. And, but because there are fewer Cs than, uh, than Bs, we just have to add some extra empty strings, and we can wrap them. So in one case, it's very easy. But uh, in another case, uh, where you have these nine blocks, and they have to be folded into seven blocks, you have to do it in a very complex way. And that's what, that's what makes the algorithm really hard. So here we combine two of these, two of these, and the nine now become five blocks. And then we add uh, two extra empty strings to get the seven. And that's how we can wrap. So there's a collection of wrapping and folding. And the way it works is we define a kind of potential function. And if you greedily optimize the potential function in every step, if there is a BFB, it will terminate in linear time. So it works very fast in principle. And now that really gives us a handle to talk about BFB. All right. So just some quick results on this uh, before we move on. Uh, so if you start with you know, BFBs of length 6, you can see that you have and this is sort of simulated data where we had uh, about many uh, sort of normal rearrangements. And in the case of BFB, the true positive examples, we still had those normal rearrangements. And we also embedded some BFB cycles in them. So if you take uh, BFBs of length 6, it's a situation is hopeless. But as you get longer and longer BFBs using the more advanced algorithm, you can start getting better results, uh, results like this. So we're not quite there. But then we use one other trick that we can get from sequencing, which is that when you have A minus A uh, you know, duplications of this form, they lead to these foldback uh, kinds of paired end mappings. And an excess of foldback is also a clue to BFB. So we just sort of combine the distance from the nearest BFB with the count vector and, and this excess of foldback. And that allows us to get results that are much better. So, we can get up to 80% uh, true positive in the simulations with uh, small ones. So the challenge here is, though, that there aren't many. We've tried this on a whole bunch of TCGA data. We only have a handful of examples, maybe three or four examples, where we can conclusively say that BFB has happened. It, it does say that if there are a few BFB cycles, you cannot really distinguish. If you have 10 or 12 BFB cycles, uh, you can actually do it. So here's one example that Campbell showed. 
and our algorithm picks it out. Here's another that we find, uh, which is very similar in properties, and you can see the sort of counts, and then we have a few other examples like this. All right, so the conclusion is that this problem, while it has, well, it admits a good algorithmic solution, and, and you know, it probably can be improved, but uh, we already have a good handle on it, is probably a rare event. It's not the thing that explains uh, a bulk of amplifications. So let's talk about uh, chromotrypsis, and let me see what time we have. So this model is actually, turns out to be more interesting. And in a, in a sort of, uh, I would say in a, in a sort of negative fashion, because this one, the hypothesis is truly extraordinary. It says that tens to hundreds of genomic rearrangements happen in a one-off cellular crisis. So this sort of shatter and then come back together and it happens in a single event. Uh, and this has to be opposed against a sort of null hypothesis, which is just that a progression of rearrangement events happen, uh, and, and that's what's causing these amplifications. And when you think about these two, it's the timing that's the critical part, and that's what makes it very tricky to handle in an algorithmic fashion. So when, when Stevens proposed this, they also came up with a nice sort of Monte Carlo-based simulation idea, and it's worth looking into what they tried. So here you have some kind of rearrangements just to explain that they had this, this particular notation about how to display breakpoints of different types. And so as you accumulate rearrangements, you will also, your genome is going to get more and more rearranged, right? And what they showed in their simulation is that if you start from a normal genome and then you start simulating uh, rearrangements, so here you have, sorry, this is too uh, small to read, but this is a duplication, an inversion, uh, another tandem duplication and so on. As you accumulate these rearrangements, you indeed get an increase in the sort of uh, discordant paired edge uh, uh, signals, but you also get an increase in the number of copy number states. So when you look at the picture of copy numbers, you'll get many, many different possible counts, many copy number states. So what they say is that if you do only progressive rearrangements, yes, you will get a lot of rearrangements, but you'll also get a lot of copy number states. And so they did this simulation where this is what progressive rearrangements we give you. you. As you increase the number of breakpoints or the number of sort of discordant reads, you also get a large increase in the number of copy number states. And what they say is that, well, if you lie outside of this distribution, that's chromotrypsis. Okay, that was their functional definition of chromotrypsis, and they tried it on a bunch of examples and came up with these three. Now, there are many issues with this kind of, and you sort of have to poke holes, not to say that chromotrypsis doesn't exist, but if you're going to try and find it algorithmically, you have to be a little bit more cautious, all right? So the first thing is we did find some errors in their code, and they actually recognized that later in a subsequent paper, and that already bends this curve a little bit. Uh, then the other things are just sort of obvious that if you take the, you know, a loser definition of breakpoints and so on, then again, the curve still begin, you know, begins to bend more and more towards these examples. And we took things that were common uh, in microarray relative to what, how confidently you could call the breakpoints and also in paired and sequencing. So these are minor things. Uh, but then we realized one thing, that when we did these simulations, it, a big difference comes from what kind of uh, rearrangements you choose. So if you limit yourself to deletions, for example, this is sort of an extreme and a stupid example, but it illustrates the point. And inversions, inversions don't change copy number whereas the deletions only reduce the copy number by one. So if you did one large deletion and then you did a bunch of inversions, you're going to end up with exactly two copy number states and a complex rearrange genome, you know, much like the chromotrypsis pattern that they came up with, right? So, so if you give this to their code, if you give this as the input, it does show up as showing up right in outside of this, their main curve and it would be selected as an example of chromotrypsis. All right. So finally, we did it the other way around also. We used sort of the rearrangement theory with you know, breakpoint graphs and minimum rearrangement distance, and we just showed that, look, if you take one of their examples, this is the example to the far right, and you try to mimic a, through a series of progressive rearrangements, you get sort of all of these rearrangements, but you mainly use inversions and deletions so as to minimize the number of copy number states. And if you did that in a sort of clever fashion, you can actually get it. Sorry, I, there is a movie out here, but it's not going to work. Let's see if it works here. Yes? How did you 
apply rearrangement analysis to these deletions? We did. Uh, it was so we we made a, a, we already have the target graph, so we we sort of know which things must come which must be rearranged. So and then there are things that are just missing from the data, which have which are, you know because the original data had copy number states which were low and high, and so you can just sort of delete that portion. Uh, it's sort of a greedy procedure plus plus some breakpoints. So we can talk offline. I can tell you how we did it. Unfortunately, the movie isn't quite working, but you can see out here that we can match most of the breakpoints. There are a few extra breakpoints that we create and a few that we don't have, and we still maintain the copy number states. All right, so, I mean, this was a tongue-in-cheek paper. We actually had a lot of trouble getting it published, a lot of uh, rejections, including from the chromotrypsis community, not surprisingly. So I want to sort of summarize the criticism that we got. Some of it is actually quite reasonable. So, you know, it's not, we're not claiming that what we have is an alternative model, but just what it is. So first, first was that you only use inversions and deletions. That's completely unrealistic, and that's true. Our goal wasn't to say that that's what it is, but just that if you're coming out with a computational signature, you have to be careful about what kind of assumptions you make. So defi definitely that's true. And then I, I also want to point out that uh, Pellman and others have come up with really beautiful experiments. Uh, there's a paper from a couple of years ago where they sort of uh, uh, show that if you can induce, uh, in a way they can induce a chromosome to lag behind during cell division, and that lagging chromosome actually does shatter. So they can show sort of parts of chromotrypsis in action, and clearly some phenomenon is happening, and so you cannot sort of say that chromotrypsis itself doesn't occur, that it's just that it might be a little bit trickier to find. All right. And so finally, you know, a very nice idea from the Raphael group uh, made this very nice point that uh, the whole debate between what we are saying and what sort of the chromotrypsis group is saying is simply this, that when you have progressive rearrangements, if you don't allow breakpoints to be reused, then you'll automatically get an increase in copy number states. If you allow breakpoints to be re reused and you're using the same breakpoints again, then automatically you, through inversions you can create the breakpoints but you can keep uh, a check on the number of copy number states. So, so the question really is this, that if you want to distinguish between uh, chromotrypsis and you want to distinguish uh, between sort of something that's happening progressive on a one-off basis, maybe the timing is the most important thing. Maybe this is the example that you can use to, uh, to do that. But then I can tell you that there are many other equally likely models which would provide similar signature. And so I want to spend the last two slides just talking about uh, sort of the old model of, of, of episome construction, right? So in this model, you have these little pieces that break off and, and they then you know, come out and they form these episomes. And as I said, if these contain origins of replication, they will form many copies and they can proliferate, right? So, so here's sort of a cartoon of this, but I want to, before I show that, I want to show you some data that is actually, that people who are sort of in the sequence community uh, have, you know, it's, it's worth looking back at some of these uh, data sets and seeing what's happening. The point here is that these extra chromosomal fragments and uh, double minute formations are not something that is a rarity. There are many, many cancer samples where if you just looked under a microscope, you would see lots and lots of copies of this. And this is sort of an example where you see 20 uh, double minutes occurring in this region. Okay. So this is something that's not, you know, not something that's rare. If you had something like this where these fragments were breaking off, uh, and so you have uh, these fragments coming together, All right. they form an episome, and then this episome or the double minute, you know, depending on the size, forms many copies. When you look at its signature on the genome, you're going to get an increase in copy number states, but they will all be the same number of copies. So you will get these oscillating copy number pattern, and you will get the rearrangements, right? So again, now, this is, these events have happened progressively. The pieces didn't have all break off at the same time, but because of the eventual proliferation, they could land up with a signature like chromotrypsis, right? It's at least, I'm not, I'm not giving you proof here. We'd actually, we're working on some of these problems, but I don't have all of the data yet. But sort of just to say that there's a big continuum of mechanisms which can be used to explain different phenomena. All right, so uh, then you might go and say, well, these are extra chromosomal structures. You know, they don't talk, they don't say anything about 
rearrangements that happen on the chromosome where we really think about, you know, in the rearrangement community, operations like double cut and join or genome rearrangements or, or breakage fusion bridge and all of these other things. So even that part is now sort of falling apart. This is a very nice paper. It's done by our collaborators, uh, and it's from a two years back, where they showed this really, I think it was quite a, quite a fascinating result. So you have this example of EGFR amplification, and you can see all of the double minutes lighting up in red because the probe was on the, on the mutant form of EGFR. So it's a glioblastoma sample. And when you give drug to it, you know, this, it's known to confer resistance. But when you actually give the drug and you look at this uh, cells, you can see that all of these double minutes have disappeared and they have integrated into this chromosomal region forming what's called an HSR. And HSR just stands for homogeneously staining regions, which means that, you know, things under, uh, they don't show the classic banding patterns. But for us, it's the same thing as saying that the double minute integrated back into the chromosome. And then when you remove the drug, um, uh, and so the resistance is, you know, there's no longer that selective pressure, the double minutes come back. So it's a thing that can go back and forth. And it tells us, and they're not the only ones who have pointed this out, that these double minutes can go in and come out. And uh, my student Viraj, who's in the audience, has done a lot of work on the sort of sequence analysis of this. I don't have the time to talk about the algorithms and all that he used, but he basically did a structural analysis of these. And here I'm not showing the breakpoints for simplicity, just sort of the copy number patterns. And so these are replicate samples from the naive case. This is the sample from the drug resistance case where it, here's the episome or the DM integrated back into the episome and came back out uh, after the drug was removed. And you can see that yes, there are changes, but the fine, but the structure is broadly recapitulated. It's the same, uh, same sort of rearranged structure that's going into the chromosome and coming back out. So when you see a rearranged uh, part of the chromosome, it could well be the result of a DM integrating into the chromosome. All right, so we, have, we are doing some more work on this, but I want to just sort of lay out this uh, somewhat more controversial idea that maybe it could be that this sort of older episome-based model of chromosomal uh, replication is, is one of the dominant mechanisms by which these amplifications can happen in cancer, whereas the other methods like breakage fusion bridge and chromotrypsis are probably oddities which do happen, but not, not with that high frequency. And then um, these, you know, if you understand this, then they can help us give a better handle on focal amplifications in cancer. And of course, I think continuing to distinguish between these models and actually say for a sample what exactly is sampling is going to be an interesting uh, research area going forward. All right, so I want to thank uh, Shai Zakev. He did the, al the hard algorithm for BFB that I didn't talk about. And Marcus Kinsella, who did uh, a lot of the BFB and chromotrypsis work that I did talk about, and then Viraj uh, has been working quite hard on episome reconstruction. I hope to speak to you about that in the near future. And I also want to thank our collaborators, Paul Michel and Frank Fornari, with whom we are exploring these episome-based models. Thank you. We have time for questions, so we'll take off the mic. Yeah. Sorry. Chris. Hi. Um, when you've got these very confusing bridge vectors, do you are there, can you tell what the order of the events are, or can you say how many different evolutions gave the same breakage fusion bridge vector? Yeah, so Chris asked a very nice question, not surprising coming from him. He said, when you have uh, the breakage fusion bridge, the way we, re we say that it's breakage fusion is bridge is that we can actually give a sequence of BFB cycles, which, uh, which, you know, which implies some kind of an order, but and he's asking if you can actually tell what the order is. So not in our, our models don't discriminate. You know, there are many, many, or, generally when something follows BFB, it, there are many orders that are compatible with it. But of course, there's been a lot of work done, and I think Chris has done some work too, where you, if you look at mutations, and you can sort of, uh, you know, see how the mutations, uh, the somatically acquired mutations on these, uh, how they fall, you can give some timing based on that. And so it's, it's sort of more detailed work, which, we kind of understand, and there are others who have done it, but we haven't done it ourselves. So we just say whether or not there's BFB. I mean, you mentioned breakpoint reuse as well. I was wondering if you assume breakpoint reuse with the break confusion bridge stuff. 
Yeah, because we, uh, at that level, you know, we're talking about many sort of tens of KBs to hundreds of KB long segments. And we're really talking about sort of gross changes in copy numbers. So, uh, so we assume sort of within that, you know, we, we don't have the breakpoint doesn't have to be very accurate. Now, what are the pros and cons of that? If you have very accurate segmentation with precise breakpoints, you will get finer counts. But then you have to remember that the true samples anyway, a heterogeneous mix of many different events, not all of them have the same amount of, so there's always this noise. And what we do is we really, we don't answer the question as a yes, no question, but we say, what's the smallest number of edits you have to make to make it compatible with something that's breakage? And that's robust to sort of changes in break, finer breakpoints as well as some changes in copy number. And if that distance is small and there's an excess of foldback operations, that's when our statistics says that it is, uh, you know, so we have a combined statistic that it is BFB, yeah. Okay, uh, so Zohar and then maybe Pavel and then you, yeah. So you just mentioned this issue of clonality of the sample. Mm -hmm. Can you actually use that to your advantage? That is, if you had several patterns that you know coexist, so to speak, in the same sample, yes. can you use that to your advantage to be able to uh, determine the process by which... Yes, if we, if we had, you know, high quality sort of single cell data and so on, we could do it. If we just have the mix, then then it's a bit hard. Multiple small samples. Multiple small samples, all of which have the same operation, possibly. I don't have, uh, you know, what you're saying is definitely possible, but we don't have the data that to, and to do it that way. Uh, is it time already to start sequencing uh, this region in the BFB model with long read technologies? So, so these are the, the segments are much longer than what the long read technologies will give us. They are they are they are anywhere from fifty to hundreds of kilobases in many cases. But it's it of course depends from and we only have a handful of cases where we strongly believe that it is BFB, but it's always like like fifty KB or something. And then many of these long read technologies are actually unsuited for high number of duplications, even though, I mean, Seraphim is in the audience, he can sort of contradict me. But when you are taking what the, if you, with the barcoding-based technologies, you're using the proximity on the genome to say that they come together. So if you want to do, you know, sort of, if you have duplications and the duplicated forms are uh, sort of inverted and so on, it's not yet clear how these, what kind of signal they will give on these, with these long reads. Maybe you want to say something, Seraphim. Yeah. I was going to say something, too, about I wonder how often you see the foldback inversions when you expect them to be there. When we've looked at the data, we tend to see fewer foldbacks than we would expect. And there's some hypothesis that it might be hard with Illumina data to actually see foldbacks if they really are essentially a palindrome. Right? If you have a read that's a palindrome, they would be missing these pairs, and that's where this would happen, and it's hard to detect. So I wonder, do you think there's a Problem with foldbacks and short reads? There is. So we, we don't see, in general, you would see very few foldback reads. And so when you're talking about 12 segments and you're talking about sort of just, you know, in those 12, just seeing if at each of those 12 positions you have an excess of foldback, the numbers are quite small. And even a small number the will be enough. The original foldbacks are oh. end up being highly amplified. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. The After the amplification. Really high copy count. Yes. So we see very few foldbacks compared yes. to what one would expect. We do. So we only treat presence and absence of a foldback at a separate. We don't actually use the counts themselves. Right. But yeah, you're right. We don't see a lot of those. And I don't have a good reason. But it, it, it could be. It could be a technology issue. Like a pack bio. That's true. That is true, but I think to do sort of high coverage pack bio on human would be, you know, it's just not difficult. But yeah, but maybe it's possible. Yeah, definitely. Yes. So there's this uh, amazing data now about the uh, chromosome conformations from high C and Chia pet. Uh, is there any support from from this uh, data to the amplification? Any any linkage? It's possible. I mean, I've looked at a lot of high C data, and we've used it for phasing genomes and so on. Um, there must be experts here, so they can contradict me if that's true or not. 
as you get long, you know, if you get more and more distant connections with Hi C, there's a chance that you're connecting trans chromosomes, you know, two different chromosomes versus the same, and you have to kind of filter that out. Most of the interesting pairs you get within 100 kb, and you know, a lot of the structural work that is done is sort of more gross, and it talks about sort of local domains and so on. And then the follow-up work is just saying, well, that these regions seem to be proximal or something like that. So I'm not sure that the scales match up in a way that we could use it for complex rearrangements like this. But if somebody has better example, then at least in the data that we have looked at, it well, doesn't seem to be useful. Evidence, at least anecdotal, of interchromosomal uh, Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, so, so you, oh, you were saying something about interchromosomal? Yeah. Sorry, then I didn't understand your question. No, I, I mean, you're saying that most of the contacts are within what they call TADs, topologically associated domains, which are maybe a few hundred KBs. Mm -hmm. But still, since you're counting all the touching point of everything, you are collecting a lot of information also about interchromosomal yes. relations. What is conceived to be interchromosomal because we are using the reference, the normal is our reference. So I, it's possible that we can use it. I haven't, I don't, haven't used it. I don't have anything interesting. Yes. Um, in the progressive model, you might expect that um, that some events would actually be del deleterious to the cell and therefore not observed. So could you, I guess, just to follow up from Zohar's line of questioning, could you leverage that to uh, in your models to potentially explain what we do observe? So, so that um, early events that are essentially fixed uh, would, would, would result in very strong signals, whereas um, the, the other events that are in the progressive model would be much more diffuse in the signal. I don't have any, I mean, it's a good question. I think the question that was posed is that the progressive uh, events, if they happen you know, sort of later, they can if there are some deleterious events, you know, there's also a selection that's going on along with that. I mean, I get your comment. I just, um, I have, maybe you have to talk offline. I don't quite connect it with what I talked about, but maybe there's a way. I mean, if you sort of, if you look at the, uh, the talk that Nico gave in the morning and you see that there's, you know, many of the times you see like a big chain of events followed by a branching. It is because there's some kind of selection at work Whenever you have selection, you see a lineage growing very strongly, and then, of course, towards the tail, you still see a lot. So that's the kind of, you'd see something similar with rearrangements also, but we haven't done it, we haven't ordered them, and we sort of, we don't know yet how best to place the data, but the, but the idea that you propose is definitely correct, yeah. Okay, good, let's thank you.